No data, no problem. With the lowest data rates in the country, have extra fun with SLT Extra GB. For more details, call 1212. Tonight, third international airport, Palali Airport upgrading takes off, but land is still the issue in North. Slipping further away, Supreme Court prevents implementation of the death penalty until October. In trouble again, Attorney General informs acting IGP to arrest the chairman of Avant Garde. Behind bars, Waiko convicted for sedition in Chennai. All these stories and much more coming up on First at 9 this Friday, the 5th of July, 2019. Fair and lovely men anti cream. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at 9. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Very good evening and welcome to First at 9 on Another Than 24 Sri Lanka's news channel. I'm Katharina Chai. Now on to your top story tonight. The Supreme Court today delivered an interim order preventing the implementation of the death penalty until the 30th of October. The decision was made after the three-member judge bench presiding took into consideration submissions presented in court on the 12 fundamental rights petitions filed against the implementation of the death penalty. Twelve fundamental rights petitions which were filed against the death penalty was taken up today before a three-member judge bench consisting of Supreme Court Justices Gamini Amarasekara, Prasanna Jawardhana and Buwaneka Aluvihare. President's Counsel M. Sumandiran appearing on behalf of the fundamental rights petition filed by K. H. Giganagi argued that the President's decision to impose the death penalty on four selected prisoners is in violation of the Constitution which states all persons are equal before the law and are entitled to equal protection of the law. Deputy Solicitor General Nerin Pulle appearing on behalf of the Attorney General however informed court that the implementation of the death penalty is a punishment meted out in accordance with the country his legal system and therefore does not violate the fundamental rights ensured by the Constitution. Taking into consideration submissions presented in court, the bench issued an interim order preventing the implementation of the death penalty until the 30th of October. It was also decided that the 12 fundamental rights petitions to be taken up again on the 29th of October. Meanwhile, the petition filed by Malinda Sinaviratna seeking an injunction order on the death penalty against four prisoners was taken up before the appeal court for the third day today. The petition was taken up before a four-member judge bench, including President of the Court of Appeal Justice Yasanta Koda Gura. Commissioner of Prisons TMW Tennakon, who appeared before court today, was questioned on whether he received any communique on date, time and place the executions will be carried out. In response, Tennakon said that he has not received any such communique to date. The court also asked whether the executions will be carried out on any of the prisoners, imminently to which the response was not any time soon. The court also asked whether the executions will be carried out on any of the prisoners imminently, to which the response was not any time soon. The judgment said that a decision on whether the petition will be taken up once more will be made on the 17th. The Commissioner General of Prisons told court no prisoner executions will be conducted before the 17th and if he receives instructions to the contrary, he will inform court. Meanwhile, UNP MP Kavinda Jayavardhana speaking to media said that a private member's bill will be tabled before Parliament against the implementation of the death penalty. The Attorney General has informed the Acting Inspector General of Police to immediately arrest the Chairman of Avant Garde Maritime Services Private Limited, Nissanka Sena Adipati and seven others. However, the Criminal Investigations Department has informed the Attorney General's Department that Sena Adipati has left the country. According to the Coordinating Officer to the Attorney General, State Counsel Nishara Jaratna, Sena Adipati has travelled to Singapore. In his letter to the acting IGP, the Attorney General states that the Supreme Court yesterday rejected the fundamental rights petitions filed by five of the suspects against their arrest. 
However, before the Supreme Court announced its decision on the petitions yesterday, the CID has informed the Attorney General that Nissan Kasena Adipati and Vishwajit Nandana Diyabalanage, who is among those to be arrested, have left the country. Accordingly, the Attorney General informed the acting IGP that there is no legal obstacle to immediately arrest the aforementioned suspects and produce them before court. The Attorney General has also instructed to report the progress before the 8th. Meanwhile, the acting IGP has instructed the CID to act on the Attorney General's directions when dealing with the case. Tamil Nadu politician V. Gopal Swami, better known as Vaiko, was sentenced to a year in jail by Chennai court convic convicting him for sedition. The conviction relates uh, to comments he made in 2009 concerning Sri Lanka at the launch of his book. Vaiko had said, quote, India will not remain one country if the war against the LTT in Sri Lanka is not stopped, unquote. Indian media say that the case was filed by the DMK, which is ironic since Vaiko was uh, this week named as a Rajya Sabha candidate by DMK Alliance in Tamil Nadu and was also set to file his nomination tomorrow. He was charged with speaking against India's sovereignty. The court also stated the execution of a sentence for a month on his application. Vaiko was arrested by the J.J. Lalita-led AIDMK government in 2002 under the Anti-Terror Prevention of Terrorism Act for a controversial speech made in support of the banned LTTE. He spent close to a year in the Velour prison. In 2014, the case against him was withdrawn. President Maitri Palasri Sena once more assures that the country is safe and there is no threat to national security. Speaking at a function held in Madhurigiriya today, the head of the state went on to say that the terror cell responsible for the Easter attack is now crushed. He also took aim at illicit narcotic racketeering in the country, highlighting it as the chief contributor to poverty. President Maitri Palasiri Sena declared open the two-storied hostel building of the Madhurigiriya Mahatalokola Vava Ananda Vidya Niketana Pirivena today. It's built at a cost of 8.4 million rupees under the project Awakening Pulo Narva. I strengthened the democracy of the people in this country unlike any other leader did before. Although a peaceful environment existed in the country, the situation changed after the incident on the 21st of April. However, even after that incident, we arrested all the suspects linked to the incidents and the government has completely crushed that organization. Therefore, permanent peace exists in the country and there is no issue related to national security. The results of the development projects that were carried out so far will be beneficial to people. Narcotics Narcotics is one of the main reasons of poverty in the country. All kinds of narcotics, including arak, cigarette, weed and moonshine, are harmful to the human body and they also damage the economy. It makes the common man a beggar. Opposition leader Mahindra Rajapaksha alleges that the United National Party is spreading falsehoods about the opposition in a bid to conceal their own in-house issues. The opposition leader also had a discussion with, with envoys of Islamic countries today where he assured continued support of the opposition on all matters of national security. A discussion was held between ambassadors and high commissioners representing the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Countries and leader of the opposition Mahinda Rajapaksa to discuss measures that can be taken to ensure radical disharmony and discrimination are uprooted from the Sri Lankan society. The meeting was held at the office of the opposition leader this afternoon and it is reported that the discussion was based on the Easter Sunday attacks and its aftermath. It is reported that the representatives of the OIC countries stressed the need for proactive measures to be taken in order to maintain security and peace, not just in the interest of Sri Lanka, but also in the interest of the region. The leader of the opposition during the discussion has assured them of the continued support of the opposition on all matters of national security and the safety of all Sri Lankan citizens. In the meantime, the office and the website of the association dubbed Paura Intellectual Professionals was unveiled by opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa this morning.
Some spread misinformation about other races to create doubt within each other. Some allege that we advise the SLPP that there is no need to seek votes of other races. They are spreading this wrong information in a very subtle way. The UNP is trying to conceal their own issues by spreading false news about us. Today, foreigners have entered every ministry. For the first time, there is a foreign official in parliament who is paid by a foreign country. The same scenario can be seen in the likes of the Election Commission and the Bribery Commission. And we see that it is catching on at other institutions as well, including the Attorney General's department. At a time when such incidents keep happening inside the government, we're happy that we're being directed to establish a new government which is honest and responsible for the sake of the country. <laughs> President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, President's Council Kaling Indetissa warns that Sri Lanka is running the risk of becoming the 53rd state of the United States of America if the country consents to several proposed agreements with the SUPA. Acquisition and cross-servicing agreement, the Status of Forces Agreement and the Millennium Challenge Corporation Agreement have come under severe scrutiny with some repelling the pacts as malignant to Sri Lanka. Having an audience with the opposition leader, Indatissi elaborated on that very possibility. A group of representatives of the Bar Association met with leader of the opposition Mahinda Rajapaksa at his official residence in Vijay Rama last evening. President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka President's Council, Kalinga Indatissa, briefed the opposition leader on the malignancy of several mooted agreements with the US, namely the Acquisition and Cross-Servicing Agreement, the Status of Forces Agreement and the Millennium Challenge Corporation Agreement. America is a military person and can be watching it. 2.9 million people, civilians and other active military people. If you want to go to the hospital, you can go to the hospital without any restriction. No passports, no checking, no controls, anything is necessary. We will be a breeding ground for We will be a breeding ground for terrorists because ISIS is going to look at Sri Lanka as a violent nation. Yes. If you want to go to the hospital, you can go to the hospital with arms. With thumbs. If you are a Kirut, you are a Lanka, and you are a Kirut. Make a ticket on the way to the Hathi April Mass in a request to cut American Bar Association, a branch of Lanka with the Stagram. Then you are a Kirut. Then you go to NGO and a credit with Stagram. A document to get you to look out to the interest of the US itself. All right. If you know the local Pama Kaka, they were near the local Kaka, Katrina. Then you go to the pending application of Dala, the non government NGO is stuck in a great general level. If American Bar Association had never got a winning number again, then need to put to my human. ලංකාවේ Palali Domestic Airport in Jaffna has been under the focus for a while, especially owing to its strategic location. The tension was long driven towards the airport since there was speculation that India might acquire the airport on these, just as China did with the Ambantuta port. But the government says that they have other plans for it, which are more tourist-centric, especially those visiting from India. Now, it is in such a backdrop that the first phase to upgrade the Palali Airport to an international airport got underway today under the patronage of Subject Minister Arjuna Ranatunga. The development of the Palali Domestic Airport, upgrading it to an international airport, kicked off today. The initial plan is for it to be converted into a regional airport to service flights to India and then into international airports with flights to other countries. The first phase of the project which will see it become a regional airport is implemented at a cost of 2 billion rupees including funds from the Sri Lanka Tourism Promotion Bureau. The first phase is already underway with the relaying of a 950 meter runway which will be extended up to 1.3 kilometers and eventually 2.3 kilometers as the second and third phases of the project respectively. The passenger flight operations between India and Sri Lanka are to commence by this August. The development of the airport is carried out as per a cabinet proposal presented by Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe in his capacity as the Minister of National Policies, Economic Affairs, Resettlement and Rehabilitation and Northern Province Development, which received approval at the cabinet meeting held on the 29th of January. 
The airport will be developed in two stages, with expansion of the runway and related facilities being completed during the first phase, while permanent terminal buildings will be constructed during the second phase, once the airport attracts a significant amount of air traffic. Speaking at the inauguration ceremony held today, Minister of Transport and Civil Aviation, Arjuna Ranatunga said that India has provided a grant to complete the development project. People who live around this airport should not be affected under any circumstances. Even though these lands are under the army custody, they should definitely provide compensation for the people are now on the street, even after being battered by a 30-year conflict. We should be bringing a national leader during the upcoming presidential election. Appointment of this national leader will pave way to minority communities to live equally with the country's other people. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe is the most favourable person in this regard. We achieved more than 75% of the land by the assistance and cooperation of the military commanders. I have to say that even today we expect another 3,000 acres of land in this area. There's mileage that's already laid down a foundation stone by the president and start the construction and how it to end to allow to operation. But the people of the area are not yet leased or allowed to resettlement of those areas. Then also that uh, I request the south road, very important, from Telepale to Point Petro, actually Point Petro. I request to very earliest possible to open the road for the public purpose, public transportation. Otherwise the people come here at the airport, if the terminal site might be the west side of the uh, airport, then people come through this way and come into this area. I earnestly request that our commander, you please cooperate. I think already known well, Mr. This our president. We requested. We have agitated many ways in a hundred times. Even the Supreme Court, the my case, I want the Supreme Court under Sarat and Silva, the Chief Justice at the time, to give me rule to lease the land, to ask the commanders and the government to take steps to lease the land. But not yet, we achieved not fully, they fully achieved. There's a, still there, there's a 2,176 cases in the Supreme Court for leasing this land. Meanwhile, Chairman of the Road Development Authority, Niha Surya Rachi, confirms that there is no stoppage in the construction work of the extension to the Southern Expressway. Surya Rachi made this remark as he moved to dispel rumours and media reports to the contrary. Giving a detailed explanation on how the events unfolded when contacted by First at Nine, Surya Rache expressed hope of finishing the project ahead of schedule. The extension to the Southern Expressway from its existing end in Mathura stretches for 96 kilometers. Funded by the Exim Bank of China and the Government of Sri Lanka, the extension is being constructed in four sections. Mathura to Beliata stretches for 30 kilometers. The stretch from Beliata to Vatia is 26 kilometers, and the Vatia to Andaravava section runs for 15 kilometers, as well as the leg from Mathura to Hambantota via Andaravava stretches 25 kilometers. The project is an investment of 255.2 billion rupees. Media reports, however, emerged recently claiming the construction work had halted. First at Nine spoke to the chairman of the Road Development Authority to get clarification on the matter. So last year on the 26th of October, we got the approval from the parliament for the supplementary allocation of about 45 billion to pay off these foreign contractors. Unfortunately, from the 26th of October, the officers were not in the normal way and I was out of the office. So there were a lot of uh, payments certified by the external resource department to the Chinese embassy. But as far as we know, they have not affected the payment. So likewise, we had a problem of allocation at the beginning of the year with our returns. We realized this. So allocations which was approved under supplementary budget in October were not effectively used. So therefore, we had a problem of allocation for this year for foreign funded projects. And by June, we applied uh, for supplementary allocation of 65 billion rupees for which we got the cabinet approval. And it was to be debated in the parliament on the 28th of June. On the strength of that, we, the RDA, promised the Chinese contractors payments would be made by 1st July. We never thought that the parliamentary debate was postponed to the next parliament date. So by that time, the Catholic uh, company had given us a letter saying that they will stop work unless we paid, if I can remember correct, on the 2nd of July. 
then we called all the contractors to ERD treasury. Then we told them reasons what we have to postpone the payment to 10th. With long discussions, they wanted to get their consent from the superiors. Then on Monday, so we had a meeting again in the ERD. So there were representation from Chinese embassy, the trade counselor, and uh, Mr. Ma of uh, Chinese Exim Bank, local representative. We explained our position and we gave them some sort of assurance that this will be paid by 10. So after that, uh, the Catholic company forwarded some other difficulties also. We said that all the difficulties we can amicably settle. And on the following day, on the 2nd, we called the Catholic company to secretary's office. We have informed the prime minister also the difficulties and he also guided us. And then the subsidy problems of Catholic also we have sorted out. Then they agreed to withdraw that letter and do the works. By that time, the media personnel had got this letter and they virally circulated. But work is continuing. There is no stoppage of work at Southern Expressway Extension. Chairman of the Road Development Authority, Nihal Surya Rachi, was also hopeful of making the expressway operational ahead of schedule. And uh, when you come into the point of opening, so we can connect 40 kilometers from extreme in Hambantota, 40 kilometers by August this year. And the way we are going, I am certain, even though the contractual completion date is December, that we could open this by November this year. Minister of National Integration, Official Languages, Social Progress and Hindu Religious Affairs, Manu Ganeshan says that majority of the country's national issues can be resolved if its citizens are able to communicate in all three languages. Speaking at the same event to mark the conclusion of Official Languages Week, Speaker of Parliament Karu Jai Surya expressed the view that politicians from the North and East must play a bigger role and in engaging in national politics instead of focusing just on their region. A special event was held today to mark the conclusion of Official Languages Week, held under the auspices of Speaker Karu Jai Surya. The event also saw the launch of Language Channel, Sri Lanka's first trilingual channel. Languages do not just give you a means to express yourself, but it also are a means to show you how you see the world. It's also very important to learn the language for economic reasons. It's also important to the, the issue of languages in terms of getting access to services. And uh, what I've learned in my uh, time here in Sri Lanka is that if you are, let's say, a young woman that has been sexually harassed, you go to the police, you are a Tamil woman, and then you try to make your case, but the police officer in front of you doesn't understand what you are saying. The situation is difficult enough as it is anyway, but then if you're not understood, and it makes it more difficult. It's also essential that the ministry uh, that is in charge of these issues here in Sri Lanka continues its proactive stance. If we as a country wish to move forward, we need national unity. Politicians in the eastern and northern province have always engaged in regional politics. There are highly intelligent politicians in these areas. They should come forward even at least after elections and come together to build this nation. I also appeal that they join hands with us to be a part of the operation of the government. We'll join you with business news right after this commercial break, so make sure you stay tuned. Welcome back. The Monetary Board of the Central Bank today extended the suspension of Perpetual Treasuries Limited from carrying out business and activities of a primary dealer for a period of six months with effect from 4.30 p.m. Issuing a statement, the Central Bank said that the move is taken in order to continue the already underway investigations conducted by the CBSL on the company. It also reads that the decision is taken in line with the regulations made under the, re under the registered Stock and Security Ordinance and the local Treasury Bills Ordinance. Minister of Development Strategies and International Trade Malik Samravikrama urges the Chinese business community to make use of Sri Lanka's preferential duty-free treatment by the US and Europe as a way to offset the growing tariff pressure of the trade war. 
attending the Sri Lanka Investment Forum in Beijing recently. The minister went on to say that this could be made possible if China are able to set up more manufacturing plants in Sri Lanka. Minister of Development Strategies and International Trade Malik Samaravikrama was in China recently to take part in the Sri Lanka Investment Forum in Beijing, which saw the participation of the Chinese business community. Speaking at the event, the minister was quoted saying that China has invested heavily in infrastructure and are assisting the island to invest in infrastructure projects and would therefore like China to get involved in setting up their manufacturing plants in Sri Lanka, primarily for the purpose of exports. According to a Chinese media outlet, the minister had gone on to say, quote, they can make use of the preferential market access we have. We have duty-free access to European Union countries and we have free trade agreements with Pakistan, Singapore and India. And since the cost of manufacturing in China is going up, we would like the Chinese to look at Sri Lanka for their manufacturing and we want it to be exported back to China, unquote. The minister also assured representatives from Chinese state-owned and private companies who attended the forum that Sri Lanka is safe for investment and highlighted that none of the industries have been affected as a result of the bombings and none of the export orders were cancelled or delayed. Commenting on the recent trade agreement with India and Japan to jointly develop the East Container Terminal at the airport of Colombo, the minister denied claims the involvement of Japan and India in Sri Lanka's biggest port project was to counter China's influence. Sri Lankan shares extended gains today to hit their highest close in 11 weeks, boosted by foreign inflows into equities. The all share price index ended up at 0.12% at 5,515.81, while the foreigners bought on a net basis for the first time in 12 sessions purchasing a net 85.3 million rupees worth of shares with a market turnover of 505 million rupees. Meanwhile, the index rose 2.67% for the week, notching its second consecutive weekly gain. We have Shavan Mendes from NDB Securities with a full report on the market performance. During the week, the ASPI gained 2.7%, mainly due to price gains in counters such as John Keel's Holdings, Commercial Bank and Distilleries. Meanwhile, the S&P SL20 increased by 3.9%. The average daily turnover for the week was up from last week to 554 million rupees. Foreigners remained active for the week, closing as net sellers, where foreign sales accounted for 51% of the total weekly turnover. The Sri Lankan rupee ended at 177 rupees and 86 cents against the US dollar today. It rose 0.17% for the week and is up 3.69% so far this year. Sri Lanka raised $2 billion via five-year and 10-year sovereign bond sales last week, topping global capital markets for the second time in three months. With that, let's now take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies around the world. that we cross over to a short commercial break. International news an Iranian official has said a British oil tanker should be seized if a detained Iranian ship is not released. British Royal Marines helped officials in Gibraltar to seize the super tanker Grace One yesterday after it was suspected of carrying oil from Iran to Syria in breach of EU sanctions. Iran later summoned the British ambassador in Tehran to complain about what he said was a form of piracy. A member of a council that advises the Supreme Court leader Ayatollah Khomeini, Mohsen Rezai, has said that Iran would resp uh, respond to bullies without hesitation. Rezai said in a tweet that, quote, if Britain does not release the Iranian oil tanker, it is the authority's duty to seize a British oil tanker, unquote. 
Gibraltar said that there was reason to believe the ship was carrying Iranian crude oil to the Banias refinery in the Syrian Mediterranean port town of Tartos. The territory's Supreme Court has ruled the tanker can be detained for a further 14 days. The clash between Rafael Nadal and Mayor Courier talent Nick Kyrgios at Wimbledon was nothing but entertaining as the friction between the duo ensured that it was a fiery contest. They don't see eye to eye ever since Kyrgios delivered an underarm serve to Nadal. But no such drama in the life of Roger Federer and he calmly ousted a home favourite. Roger Federer dashed home hopes of an outlandish upset at Wimbledon by easing into the third round with a 6-1-7-6-6-2 win over Britain's world number 169, Jay Clark. Federer had never lost a Grand Slam match to somebody as low as Clark in the rankings and despite the Briton putting up a brave fight in the second set, the huge gulf in class ensured the Swiss never had to get out of second gear. Portugal's João Souza also reached the third round with a 6-4-6-4-6-4 victory over 2017 runner-up Marin Cilic. The big serving Cilic served eight double falls and made 46 unforced errors to hand the unseeded 30-year-old a ticket to the last 32. Third seed and twice champion Rafael Nadal emerged victorious from a memorable four-set duel with Australian wild man Nick Kyrgios that delivered everything it had promised in front of an enraptured Wimbledon centre court crowd. Fiery Kyrgios threw everything he had at Nadal, including an extraordinary 230 km per hour second serve ace and undoubtedly had him rattled before the Spaniard eventually prevailed 6-3, 3-6, 7-6, 7-6. In the post-match media briefing, Kyrgios was in an unapologetic mood over his tactics. If you hit someone with the ball. I didn't hit him. He's racking, no? But why would I apologise? I won the point. He didn't look too pleased. And? But he, he, he seemed to wind him up and then he, you know, he with him. I don't care. Why would I apologise? I mean, the dude's got how many slams? How much money in the bank account? I think he can take a ball to the chest, bro. I'm not going to apologise to him at all. Did you aim it straight at him? I was going for him, yeah. I wanted to hit him square in the chest. Lucky's got decent hands. Meanwhile, in the women's draw, Petra Kvitova egged out a 7-5, 6-2 win over Kristina Mladenovic to advance as well. The 2011 and 2014 champion, who was still sporting a bandage around her left elbow after missing the French Open with an arm injury, was swinging more freely as the match went as she won 10 of the last 12 games to book a place in the third round for the first time since 2015. Pakistan are taking on Bangladesh in what is seen as a dead rubber at the ICC Cricket World Cup at Lords. Opting to bat first, Pakistan put on 315 for the loss of nine wickets in their 50 overs with opener Imam ul Haq top scoring with 100 runs. Chasing 316 for victory, the Bengali Tigers are currently on 154 for the loss of five wickets. And with that, we conclude this edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining us and have a pleasant evening.